Mary Oliver, Instructions for Living a Life. Pay attention. <laughs> Someone is paying attention. Be astonished. Tell about it. And from Brian Doyle, Notes on Wonder. Of course, you do your absolute best to find and hone and wield your divine gifts. You do your best to reach out tenderly, to touch and elevate as many people as you can. You bring your naked love and defiant courage and salty grace to bear as much as you can with all the attentiveness and humor you can muster. This life, after all, is a miracle, and we ought to pay fierce attention to every moment as much as possible. If you'd like more information, email us at 
welcome at uugroton.org. We're not concerned about the noise during the service and hope you won't be either. However, the service is broadcast in several places downstairs if anyone needs to take a break. And their soft pouches in the pews have quite toys in them. And there are two nurseries with toys through the door by the high pulpit. And you're welcome to take kids there as well. We have a game Sunday today. Oh, that and was last Sunday. Or, sorry. Today is religious education. Ah, whatever. We roll with it. We had a great game Sunday last Sunday. I just wanted to have you remind me. Remind Rejoice in the memory. We will see the kids downstairs in a little while. There is a small mask required section in the back of the parking lot side for those who prefer to sit with other masked people. And please know that we have a very effective air filtration system running. You can, you can attend the service again tonight. We host virtual church on Zoom at 7 p.m. on Sunday evenings. All are welcome. If you need the link, I'll come welcome up one more time. If you need the link, email us at welcome at uugrotten.org. Special thanks today to Holly Estes, who's filming this morning, and to the adult choir. Thank you to Marcella Nancy Gates, Cates, and Nancy Simonton, who greeted us downstairs, and to Margaret Burdine and Lois Young, who are hosting Coffee Hour today. Finally, thank you to Kathy and Greg Reif, who are ushering today. They have large print orders of service and assisted listening devices, so if you need anything during the service, they will be happy to help. A few announcements. First one's mine. You got this age of order of service. Um, we're going to do this today at Coffee Hour. It's going to be really fun. And what the program is, is we're part of the Unitarian Universalist Association. Um, there are many members of uh, the UUA's Church of Larger Fellowship who don't go to a physical church because they are uncomfortable with it, maybe there, there is no one nearby, or they're in prisons. There are about 2,000 members of the UUA Church of Larger Fellowship in prisons. And what we do is we try to send a holiday message to every single one of them. So we decided this year, I decided this year. <laughs> send 30 because we're a congregation that is a blessing to the world. We have learned through the pandemic that our sanctuary is not this room or any place at all. Sanctuary is what we create together. So please come in and rest a while. You are so welcome here. Now please take a second to wave to the camera, say hi to the virtual congregation, and stand as you're able, and let's greet each other. Hi, camera.
service by ringing three bells and inviting us more fully into our physical and spiritual and emotional presence, inviting us to see if we can settle and feel what's actually around us, to feel what's within us and our wholeness and our belonging. We invite you to take three breaths, if that's comfortable, and or you can tighten something in your body and then release it in these three breaths, these three bells, as a gesture of opening, opening to all the blessing, whether it's challenging or easy. This first breath, beloved, is just for you. The invitation for the second bell is to send your love, your heart, to the people who are so dear to you. And the third we send out to this whole beautiful world. remotely, I invite you to get a candle or chalice and light it as we light our common chalice in the meeting house. The idea of the flaming chalice grew from the Unitarian Service Committee's brave and dangerous work during the Second World War, helping to smuggle Jews and other persecuted people out of Europe. It's a symbol of trust and courage and resistance to oppression and tyranny. <coughs> Heidi Adams will light the chalice this morning. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning Lars. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um, let me see, me collect my thoughts. Okay, this is called Canción de Navidad. From my earliest memories, mi papá has always been a nice, hard-working, humble man. He's retired now, but he worked almost every scheduled day. Christmas, New Year's, quinceañeras, or the parties. Mi abuela used to say he had a very large family. My papa is very quiet, very few, few, few work. With the exception when he's singing to the Beatles, the Bee Gees, and during Christmas, Navidad, on the day when we decorate the trees, you must definitely will catch him singing or humming this beautiful Christmas song. Oh, árbol de la Navidad, tus luces como brillan. Oh, árbol de la Navidad, tus luces como brillan. Or in English, or oh, Christmas tree. So we are planning the challenge in honor of music that we remember and enjoy during the holidays to each of us have holidays. we light a peace candle to remind us that Ukraine is still at war as are Myanmar, Myanmar Libya, Syria, and there is violence in many places around the world. In this country there have been 611 
mass shootings in the United States in the year 2022. Each life taken was precious and unique and singular. We light the peace candle to help us remember that we need to rededicate ourselves again and again to peace in our own lives, in our families, and our communities.
Mori. Anybody who would like to see the picture should come on up here too. Max, you're first. Okay, first. Hi, Amelia. Come on up here. Hi, Finn. Hi, Ezra. Oh, and a sloth is here. So, first let's say our words for gathering with the hand motions. We are Unitarian Universalists with minds that think, hearts that love, and hands ready to help. Or hug. Or hug. That's right. We need to add that. Okay. Yeah, we need to add that because that is really important. Okay, so today's story, and Abby is going to show us the pictures, is called We're All Wonders by R.J. Palaccio. Now, wonder has two meanings. If I say, I wonder what your favorite ice cream is, what does it mean to wonder? Yes, Amelia. Yes, you're asking somebody, you're being curious because you don't know. And if I say, you are a wonder, or you are wonderful, what does that mean? What does that mean? You are beautiful. You are beautiful. What else does it mean? What else? You, you are lovely. You are lovely. Amelia, you have wonderful ideas. You are special. You are full of good stuff. Um, you're welcome here. Yes, you're welcome here. And sometimes the two kinds of wonder are related. If I can wonder about something and be curious about it and want to know more about it, I'm more likely to be able to see how wonderful it is. Yes? Say it again. That is such a good question. Right now, when are we going to start this story? <laughs> Because somebody has been talking a long time. All right, let's start the story already. Okay, one, We're All Wonders by R.J. Palaccio. I know I'm not an ordinary kid. Sure, I do ordinary things. I ride a bike. I eat ice cream. I play ball. I just don't look ordinary. I don't look like other kids. My mom says I'm unique. <laughs> Wait, what does unique mean? You're, you're kind of like cool and yourself. You're kind of cool and you're kind of yourself. Yeah, that's about it. That's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mom says I'm a wonder. Ha! My dog Daisy agrees. But some people don't see that I'm a wonder. All they see is how different I look. Sometimes they stare at me, they point or laugh, and they even say mean things behind my back, but I can hear them. It hurts my feelings. It hurts Daisy's feelings, too. Has anybody ever had that experience where somebody said mean things and it hurt your feelings? Yeah, a lot of people have. <sighs> so when that happens, I put on my helmet. And I put on Daisy's helmet too. And then we blast off. Knew it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't see any people, but I know they're there. Billions of people. People down there on Earth of all different colors. 
People like me who move differently and talk differently and don't talk at all. People who look different. The earth is big enough for all the kinds of people. I know I can't change the way that I look, and I don't want to change the way that I look. This is me. But maybe, just maybe, I can change the way people see. And if they do, they'll see that I'm a wonder. And they'll see that they are all wonders too. Yo, we are all wonders. Yep, that's true. Me and yep, that's true. Oh, I just saw the earth in his eyes. Oh, the earth is in his eye. Oh. That's beautiful.
He died too soon in 2017 from a brain tumor. His work, like the poet Mary Oliver's, was all about seeing beauty in the small, in the everyday, finding wonder in the landscape of the Pacific Northwest where he lived, finding wonder in his family. Joey is one of Brian Doyle's sons. They are young adults now, his three children. But this was about when Joey was young. A while ago, I got sick. It was a thorough and major sick. Lost use of the old hands and feet, which was, as you can imagine, weird. My kids called the sickness the thing. The thing went on for months and months. I could tell you lots of stories about the thing, but there's only one story I want to tell you. Every morning, my son got up early to help me put my socks. I would sit on the back stairs in the dark, and he would wrestle my socks on, and neither of us would say any words. And I still can't think of anything cooler than that. I have racked my brains and considered all of the possibilities of love, and I still return to that boy and those socks. No matter what happens to me, that happened to me.
have to remember to introduce myself, so maybe third time's a charm. <laughs> my name is Lee Kinby. I'm the intern minister here, and my pronouns are they, them. Begin his spoken prayer with Brian Doyle's prayer for the elderly woman on the train eating one almond almost every five minutes for two hours for a grand total of 40 almonds, and believe me, I counted. Fascinated. <laughs> That's the title. I counted fascinated partly because she was about eight inches from me, and the intricate process of getting the bag almonds out of her vest carrier and then choosing the right one, and then chewing that single almond as carefully and slowly as any being has ever blessed this world and chewed a single nut back into individual atoms. And this is driving me quite bonkers. But I'm fascinated too because she has slowly and silently reminded me not to be an arrogant idiot. Maybe this is all the food she has for her journey. Maybe she's a bodhisattva who's trying to remind me to savor every instant of this wild and lovely and maybe she's a saint who is saying to me gently, assume nothing. The exterior is a disguise and a costume, and I am a holy being also formed from the imaginative one. And here we are together, younger brother, on a train with almonds. Are we not blessed? Are we not graced beyond words that no one is shooting at us? We are rushing magically through the countryside without effort. Our bellies are not shriveled from starvation. We are alive and breathing. And there is the redolence of almonds between us. Maybe. These things are true, and she's right. And I grin and feel a tinge of regret, actually, when she finishes the bag, which must have contained exactly 40 almonds. Did she count them out last night? One by one, staring intently at each small russet each small oblong glory before she sealed the bag. So then I pray for each of us that we stare intently at the wilderness of miracles around us every moment. Around us every moment. So very many of them savory. So very many of them savory. And so, amen. We gathered, send our collective prayers and wishes to all who are grieving, to all who are supporting grieving loved ones, to all people facing health challenges, and for people whose loved ones, including pets, are living with illness. We hold collectively our people coping every day with systemic racism, coping every day with mental illness, with the effects of addictions, with the slow grind of financial stress. And we hold in tender prayer everyone gathered here today who both loves and struggles with this particular season and its relentless expectations. So let's pause. Alive and breathing. Reminding ourselves that we have been through so much. That there is wonder and that despite it all, 
we are still going, even on the days when we stumble and we find ourselves face down. We allow the pause. We allow the breath. We allow the sensation. Tell somebody you love them. Take a hot bath. Chew your food slowly. Stare intently at the miracles. We are all bright spirits wearing animal hides. And there is no human on earth who couldn't use a little more kindness right about including you. Our generosity sustains this congregation and allows us to deepen spiritually, to take care of one another, and to be a blessing to this world. We can't make church without all of us. There is a QR code on the back page of the order of service if you would like to donate through PayPal. The morning offering will now be given and gratefully received. Well, <laughs> yes. Yes. 
I do have to come back, but I will want to come back in mid-May, and we will all finish the church year together. She asked if the minister sabbatical is like an academic sabbatical, and I will be expected to do original research and write a book, <laughs> which lucky for me, it is not, though I do plan to write a little bit. And then she asked somewhat puzzled, I think, well, if you don't have to do anything, what are you going to do? And I blurted out the first thing, which is rest. I'm going to rest after the last nearly three years, which have been a lot of things, some of them very good, but easy is not one of those things. I'm also going to practice the violin, which I am just starting to learn. Alan and I are going to travel. I hope to walk a lot and cook a lot and read some books. But as I have learned on the past two sabbaticals, the time goes by fast. And making a million plans and a long sabbatical to-do list is not the best way to actually rest. I've also learned that it takes time to slow down. It takes time to see what is in front of me, to practice being where I am. This doesn't come naturally, or maybe I'm just so out of the habit. And I know I'm not alone. I know that many of us struggle to move through time more slowly, more deliberately, to pay more attention. And thinking back on it, I wish I had said that what I'm going to do on my sabbatical is wonder. I'm going to look for wonder in all the ways I can. And I'm going to wonder about myself, about you, about the future. And I also know from experience that moving slowly and doing less is one of the shortest ways to let wonder find me. I think a lot of us long for less, less to do less to take care of, less to want, less to buy, less to accomplish, especially at this time of year. And it's hard to know how. How can we work less if the bills are barely getting paid? How can we do less when the demands of our lives seem unending? and the world is full of need? How can we lower our expectations when everything feels important, even essential, and we are not generally a people of low expectations? And even if our lives are not full to overflowing, our minds often are. We are full of opinions, and thoughts. We are full of regrets and memories and stories about the past. We're full of hopes and fears and plans and imaginings about the future. We are full of the news. Buddhism teaches that the root of all human suffering is our desire. Our pain is caused by our attachment to all of our people and to all of our things. And we hold on too tightly. We try to control what we cannot control, which is pretty much every single thing, except how we respond to this present moment, the moment we are in but we are attached 
we're attached to the way we want things to turn out, and we experience loss and fear and frustration when things don't turn out the way we plan, when life does not conform to our expectations, which at least in my 57 years of experience, it never does. Sometimes it's worse, but often it's better. And it's almost never what I expected. So I was getting my hair done a while back, which I don't call coloring. I call it historic restoration. <laughs> we're just bringing things back to the way they once were. So in during the restoration process, which is not short, I confess that I was listening to a conversation happening nearby me between two women under the hair dryers. Now, in my defense, they were speaking really loudly because the dryers were on. And one woman was telling the other woman all about her, res her renovation plans for her new kitchen. And she was describing every single minute detail. She told how the color of the walls was going to perfectly match the tile, and how she had finally found the perfect cabinet handles after trying a bunch of different ones, and how the material for the countertop she had chosen was exactly what she wanted, as were the light fixtures. And she repeated the words perfect and exactly what I wanted several times, and it got my attention. And I further confess, I thought to myself, this cannot possibly turn out well. <laughs> I didn't say it, though. This cannot possibly turn out well, I thought, because at least in the telling I heard, which admittedly was not the whole story, it seemed like she might have forgotten that kitchens get messy when we cook in them. And that any room that human beings, and God forbid dogs, actually live in for any period of time, much less eat in regularly, tends not to stay perfect. I'm not saying don't renovate your kitchen. But what I am saying is we get so attached to our plans and to exactly what we want and to things being perfect, however we define perfect, the perfect holidays, where no one is sad or angry or missing someone who's not there and our houses look all festive and lovely and there is enough money and time to find the exactly right thoughtful gifts and people we love to give them to, and on and on and on. And our expectations and hopes and plans can bring us so far from what already is, from what actually is, and to the idea that maybe we could accept and even see the beauty, the wonder, in the imperfect, messy reality of our actual, complicated lives. Now, it is possible that this year I will get to putting up a wreath and some Christmas lights because I love those things and they make me happy, but in the meantime, there are molding pumpkins on my front steps. <laughs> and if I can change the way I see them, maybe I could see that those are beautiful too. In his book called To Taste and See, Thomas Mann tells this sweet little memory that I know I've told you before. He writes, my father was once walking on the beach with his three-year-old grandchild. 
when the little one stopped and picked up a tiny fragment of a seashell and began to examine it. And my tall father bent way down and looking at the tiny fragment in the tiny hand asked, how could you ever see such a little shell? Because, said the three-year-old, I have little eyes. <laughs> we live in a culture that tells us in a thousand ways that bigger and more is better. But I think we need to relearn to see with little eyes. When we see with smaller eyes, we might find we are better at picking out those little pieces of a broken seashell, those little fragments of beauty that are spread out before us, but we walk right by all the time. When we hear with smaller ears, we might start to hear the beauty in quiet, in the space between words. And when we touch with smaller hands, we might find that we need less, we hold on to less, we buy less, we grasp less. Seeing with little eyes means seeing what is here already and finding wonder in it. I think this is what Mary Oliver means when she gives us her instructions for living a life. Pay attention. Be astonished. Tell about it. I believe that one of the most important things we do here in this simple white room is to pay attention so that we might learn to be astonished, that we might see and hear and feel wonder and tell about it. It is such a strange thing we do here, really. We come to this place for an hour or so just to be. We come to sit in the morning light. We come to accomplish nothing, to produce nothing other than being here, feeling the fullness of quiet, listening to the music of the morning, the sounds of voices speaking and hands clapping and singing, to feel our bodies hopefully at rest or at least a little more at rest. We come to this place where time moves slowly so that we might touch and feel and hear and see wonder. Wonder in the small, in the face of a child, in the words of a poem, in the smile of a stranger or friend, in the sight of a little girl who dances during the hymns and the music in the choir loft. Next week, just turn around and look. <laughs> Try to be here now. Try to put aside the holiday to-do list you are writing on your order of service. <laughs> <laughs> the grocery list you are composing in your head. The thought of all that comes next today, and do your kids have homework, and why is the car making that bad noise, and what will the results of that latest medical test be? You can pick it up all <coughs> in a moment. But for now, just be here. And know that to be here in this moment, exactly as it is with all of its irritations or contentment, with your runny nose or empty stomach or tired eyes, it's enough. Thomas Merton, who was a contemplative monk, 
referred to his time of prayer and meditation as keeping one's daily appointment with mystery. Keeping one's daily appointment with mystery. I love this. We could put that right into our Google calendars. Put in a daily appointment with mystery. And then each of us can decide what to do when it pops up. You could stop the car and stand outside and look at the sky. You could take four deep breaths. You could listen to a song you love. You could tell someone, I love you. You could kiss the dog. My colleague, Victoria Safford, suggests something similar. <coughs> she says we could make ourselves little daily appointment with wonder lists and keep those lists right alongside the to-do lists. A daily appointment with wonder list might read something like this, she writes. 10 a.m., remove shoes and remember the ground is holy. 1.45, forgiveness of self as needed, forgiveness of others as needed. 5.15, wonder, awe, general astonishment at being alive. And then, five minutes each, gratitude, wild laughter, exuberance, reverent, irreverence, etc. 11 p.m., ponder large questions. 11.05, sleep deeply and well all through the night. What would it look like, your daily appointment with wonder list? What does it look like? To keep a daily appointment with wonder, to keep even this weekly appointment with wonder changes us. It helps us see and hear and feel the world with all of its struggle and complexity and sorrow as also a place of astonishing beauty and goodness. One of the reasons I chose Brian Doyle's book, Notes on Wonder, for one of our congregational summer reads is because of how he sees and hears and notices and then writes about the small wonders of this world. His essay called Cool Things is pages of the wonders he notices. And I'm gonna share just a little bit of it here. He writes, I sing a song of things that make us grin and bow that just for an instant let us see the incomprehensible, inexhaustible, inexplicable yes, such as, for example, to name a few. The way the sun crawls over the rim of the world every morning like a child's face rising, beaming from a pool, all fresh from the womb of dark and the way jays, hop, and damselflies do that geometric arrow amazing thing, and bees inspect, oh. and birds probe, and swifts chitter, and the way the young mother at the bus stop has her infant swaddled and huddled against her chest like a blinking extra heart, and the way seals peer at me owlishly from the surf like rubbery grandfather. <laughs> and the way no pavement or concrete cement thing can ultimately defeat a tiny, relentless green thing. And the way infants finally discover to their absolute agogishment that those fists swooping by like tiny, fleshy comets are theirs. And the way crows arrange themselves on the fence like notes of a song I don't yet know and the way car engines sigh for a minute after you turn them off, and the way people touch each other's forearms when they are scared, and the way every once in a while someone you hardly know says something so piercingly 
honest, that you, ju that you wanna just kneel down right there in the grocery store near, near the pears. He goes on like this for pages. And then he ends with this. I know all too well that the story of the world is entropy. That things fly apart, we sicken, we fail, we grow weary, we divorce, we are hammered and hounded by loss. But I also know with all my muddled heart that we are carved out of immense holiness. We are carved out of immense holiness and surrounded by wonder. We ourselves are wonders. We just have.